Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring the psychology of remote viewing. With me is Professor Charles Tart, an emeritus professor of psychology at the University of California, Davis, and also an emeritus professor at the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology. Professor Tart was actually my mentor and a faculty member on my doctoral dissertation committee when I was a graduate student in parapsychology at Berkeley. He is the author of numerous books in the field and over a hundred scientific papers in parapsychology. His publications include the classic anthology, Altered States of Consciousness. His other books include Learning to Use ESP and Psy, Scientific Studies in the Psychic Realm, and uh, he is also a co-editor of an important anthology in remote viewing called Mind at Large, which uh, he co-edited with Russell Targ and Hal Putoff uh, at a time when he was an associate at SRI International, or the Stanford Research Institute, the Stanford Research Institute, when it was doing the pioneering work in remote viewing. Welcome, Charlie. It's good to be here, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, you were there really to witness, or very close to witnessing, the birth of the discipline of remote viewing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those were interesting times. That was the late 70s, as mm -hmm. if I got my chronology right. And there were several people interested in parapsychological research in the Bay Area. So I was having a monthly meeting at my home for these researchers where they could talk about what they were doing and problems or hints for better stuff and so forth. And that's where I first heard about, well, no, it's not quite where I first heard about remote viewing. Mm -hmm. I've known Russell Targ for a zillion years. Yeah. but. Russell and Howe presented a thing on their remote viewing studies, and they gave several examples. Now, I was very interested because the quality of the ESP, or the intensity of the ESP, seemed to be a lot higher than we get in the usual multiple choice guessing mm -hmm. tests. Well, they reached a point after giving several examples of good remote viewings that they said, okay, we're going to demonstrate it to you. Howe is going to leave and in half an hour, he'll be somewhere that he can drive to. Okay, that narrows it down to about two million targets in the Bay Area. <laughs> somewhere, okay. So Hal goes off, and about half an hour later, Russell tells us to take some paper and pencil and see if we get any visual images of where Hal might be. Well, I drew some. I didn't expect to see any signs of ESP. I don't think of myself as psychic. And everybody did and whatnot. And we did that for, oh, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, another 15 minutes or so later, Hal came back. And Russell said, good, we'll take you to the target now. Well, what I had had some images of and made a little rough drawing of was I thought I saw some kind of factory. And there were machines in it which had a lot of circular motion in them. And it was the there were white sort of machines, and the whole thing was lit very brightly, but mm -hmm. I didn't. So anyway, they took us someplace on University Avenue, and we parked and walked over, and we stopped in front of this store, and it, nothing looked anything like what mm -hmm. I remote viewed, nothing at all, till I stepped over three feet further and looked through the laundromat's window and saw all the white machines of washers and uh -huh. dryers spinning around in a very bright place. I said, yeah. oh, huh? I got some remote viewing out of me. That's impressive. Well, now, was that the target? Or? That was the target, uh -huh. yeah. You know, 
I, I was just standing in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. Alan stood there right in front of the window looking into the laundromat. I see. It's a wonder he wasn't arrested for hanging around like that. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so that was a sort of personal introduction that this remote yeah. viewing can get pretty interesting. Because in, in your decades as a parapsychologist, you weren't particularly a, an experiencer, I guess. No, I never thought of myself particularly as an experiencer. You know, when, when people ask me how I got interested in parapsychology, they're, they're always hoping for a good story. You know, God mm -hmm. dropped by one day and said, yeah. young man, thou shalt do parapsychology. But yeah, I have it, stories it, like that. Yeah. But, <laughs> but with me, it was much more an intellectual reading of the mm -hmm. literature as part of working on my conflict between mm -hmm. science and religion. But your experience, as I understand it, is quite typical of the people who Hal and Russell were worked with who were yes. already accomplished professionals, self-confident individuals given a new task, supposedly yes. an impossible task, but told you can do it and you do. Yes. And that's one of the most important things that I guess about the psychology of remote viewing. Mm -hmm. uh, most parapsychology experiments, most psychology experiments are done with college sophomores, basically. You know, and some wit once defined psychology as uh, the study of college sophomores by former college sophomores for the benefit of future college sophomores. Mm -hmm. Well, college sophomores are unclear about mm -hmm. a lot of things, okay? the. People that they used as viewers at SRI were almost always contract monitors, visiting government officials and the like. As you say, they were people who were successful people used to doing difficult things and were shown some examples of other people like them who'd done it, and they did it. Mm -hmm. They didn't think they were psychic, but they were used to succeeding at what they were doing. And, and it's, we ought to point out that that research was funded by the government for 20 years. And oh, yes. One of the reasons, I think, is because the contract monitors themselves who, who came in from Washington, D.C., were asked, well, you, you try it. You be yeah. the viewer. And yeah. very hard for them to say this is all bunko when they're doing it on their own account. The monitors come in and say, well, I'm skeptical. Show me an example of remote viewing. And they say, sure, and you're the viewer. <laughs> <laughs> that tended to catch people off guard. And, and it also created, to my uh, mind, a distinction between remote viewers and people who think of themselves as psychics. Mm -hmm. Remote viewers often say, well, I'm not psychic, but I can do remote viewing. Interesting distinction. Yeah. Yeah. By but which anyway. they mean they don't burn candles or read tarot cards or do past life readings and, and so on. Yeah. But that's the that's first big clue to the psychology there. Work with successful people, not mm -hmm. people unsure who they are, what they want to do in life, and yeah. so forth. Yeah. So I was impressed enough that I thought, I wonder if I can get a year off from teaching at Davis and go down and work on the project with them. And mm -hmm. My department was initially a little hostile to my doing that, but on the other hand, some of them were probably glad to get this weirdo who does ESP studies away for a year. So <laughs> I managed yeah. to get some leave, mm -hmm. um, and I went down and worked as a consultant for a year. And the next big clue to the psychology came the first time I got there. Mm -hmm. I pulled into a parking lot, and the building I had to go into, there was immediately a desk there and a guard. This was a secure facility. Mm -hmm. Okay, This was not some college campus somewhere with kids in t-shirts wandering around. Yeah. This was big deal. No, I couldn't go right in. One of the investigators would have to come and fetch me and guide me around for mm -hmm. the rest of the day. And meanwhile, I had to sign in, have a temporary badge prepared and all that. Mm -hmm. I was undergoing a major psychological procedure it's already. It's a big military me, industrial yeah, think tank. This is a big, important place, and you are being treated in a special way, and yeah. uh, it, it must be even dangerous in a way, you know, if there's security mm -hmm. all over the yeah. place. Then the next major psychological thing was, I forget whether it was Raul or Howell or Russ who came down and got me, and they took me mm -hmm. up to their lab, which was in uh, another building, but rather than just follow along the corridors, they took shortcuts through a few other labs to save walking down long corridors. Huh. 
And these labs were full of the most fascinating scientific equipment, the computers computing, the lights blinking. It was very clear to me, I was in the temple of big science, mm -hmm. right? Wow. Then they finally get me to their lab and they show me examples of, you know, this contract monitor viewed this thing this way, really impressive sort of thing. Mm -hmm. By then, I was mind blown, and I realized this is what happens to all the people who come here. Mm -hmm. They get indoctrinated. This is not some low-paid professor doing a project with college sophomores somewhere. This is a big deal. Yeah. That makes an enormous difference. Mm -hmm. And they don't do a whole bunch of experiments one day. They're focused on you as an individual for at least half a day mm -hmm. to prepare you for a remote viewing. On a single trial. Yeah, a single trial of it. You get feedback on how well you did. Mm -hmm. um, wow, it's so different from, you know, so you, you'll get one experimental unit of credit if you sign up for this experiment. You've got to be there at 5.15 and be there for half an hour and mm -hmm. go away. You're subject number 278. <laughs> very, very different. Mm -hmm. You're not treated like a college student. Yeah. Yeah. At all. And, and I suppose it's fair to say that uh, Hal Putoff and Russell Targ and their published studies of remote viewing have... Uh, one of the best track records in all of parapsychology. Yes. In that year at SRI, the feeling that pervaded all the experiments was once in a while we don't get any psychic in stuff in an experiment. What did we do wrong instead of, gee, we were really lucky this year we got two experiments that worked. <laughs> <laughs> they had a confidence, a well-earned confidence mm -hmm. that things would work right. Yeah. Although it's funny, here's a funny observation here. I was talking to Russell once after he'd been doing this kind of stuff for a number of years. He said, you know, the skeptical argument, every once in a while I begin to think, there can't really be psychic stuff, is there? It's it's like the social conditioning creeps mm -hmm. up, and I need to see a good remote viewing then to remind me, of, oh yeah, this stuff really works. <laughs> yeah. So when you're exposed to that mm -hmm. stuff all the time, it totally shifts your view of what's possible in the mm -hmm. world. And what was your role as, as you got involved uh, over the years? I played a number of different roles. For one, one of them, which was very interesting, was trying to understand the judging process, mm -hmm. okay? As you and most of your viewers probably know, a viewer remote views someplace, and then for a formal evaluation, the transcript of what they said is mixed in with a bunch of other transcripts intended for other places, and a judge goes out and compares the transcript at each place to what's actually there. And the judge is blind, not in the sense that they can't see, but they don't know that transcript three was intended to go with target number F or mm -hmm. something like that. If there's nothing but chance operating, or just vague generalities, you know, I can remote view your house. It's very bright up above and solid feeling below, right? I'm, I'm right, yeah. If there's nothing but generalities, then we know by chance there'll just be a few matches. Sure. But if they're getting things correct by remote viewing, you'll get a lot more matches than you can get, and you can actually evaluate it statistically. Mm -hmm. So you solve the problem of people being too credulous. Oh, you knew it was solid below? You must be the best psychic on Earth. And people who were super skeptical. Mm -hmm. What? You said my dog has seven legs, and that's true? Well, there are a lot of seven-legged dogs around. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I worked on the psychology of that. How do you do the judging? And it mm -hmm. turned out, it was a very complicated The test. judging I, is really yeah. just as important as yeah. the viewing. Yeah. I thought I was going to fairly quickly work out the major dimensions of judging and figure out how to make it more efficient. Mm -hmm. But acting as a judge a few times myself and analyzing other judges, it's hard. You know, If somebody says, I see a tall red building, uh, is that a single object that's present or absent? Or does any tall object count as a hit? Does any red object count as a hit? Mm -hmm. You know, how far do you break things down? It yeah. gets tricky. You know, if you have really tremendously accurate remote viewing, a particular experiment is easily judged. Mm -hmm. But 
when it's more marginal, it's really hard to break that down. Furthermore, the judging has one great disadvantage. It doesn't give you a really precise measure of just how much psi was there in the remote viewing. Right? If, if you give me a pool of 10 targets, and all I do is give you the cor correctly the name of the street each target is on, there'll be a perfect matching. Mm -hmm. But I only gave you one item of information about each. Yeah. It doesn't sound like much psi at all, even though it happened to be a crucial An one. An actual name is pretty so, good. <laughs> so how do you begin to estimate how much information is right. actually there? Because that's one of the things that would help us understand what the actual psychic process information is. Information rates. Yeah, what's mm -hmm. the information rate? Signal to noise you know? issues. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, where that you, turned out begin to be to very hard. Match it in with communication theory, yeah. for yeah. example. Yeah. We uh, held a little mini conference once with several judges to get them to talk to each other on what kind of techniques they used, and we had vague thoughts of publishing a manual on judging, but I don't think that ever got clear Would enough results that do. that was I know wild. that uh, the Newsweek story that was published about a year ago in 2015, November 2015, uh, as I recall, about Ed May, who ran the program after it left SRI mm -hmm. for about 10 years, received government funding. and. Uh, one of the criticisms mentioned in Newsweek is that, well, it only works so well because Ed May himself did all the judging. Yep. And that is a contaminating factor in a sense. You could just have a psychic judge. The remote viewing could have been lousy, mm -hmm. but the judge is psychic enough to match them up. So what do you do? You tell the judge, do not be psychic. Uh, if you could make the judging something purely logical, right? You've got a checklist. Is there something red? Yes or no. Is mm -hmm. there something tall? Yes or no. You could minimize that, but otherwise a psychic judge yeah. might be a real contaminant. And, and factor. there are uh, protocols that, uh, that are like uh, the ones you describe, where they might have uh, 20 or 30 qualitative mm -hmm. uh, items that are or are not part of the target, mm -hmm. and uh, they can be evaluated that way. I don't know that that protocol really works so well. Well, it's got advantages and disadvantages, you yeah. know, because if you break things down, you may find individual items that you check off that were mm -hmm. correctly viewed, but the way they're put together is an item of information in itself, and if you've disassembled this tall red building, into something tall, something red, some mm -hmm. kind of building, uh, you may miss one of the most mm -hmm. crucial aspects of the remote viewing. So it's not like we know the best way to judge remote yeah. viewing. There's a lot that could be developed sure. there. But to go back to uh, the situation with Ed May, I want to clarify one point, which is that the, even though he was apparently the only judge for a long time, and uh, the critic Ray Hyman said, oh no, that's a no-no, you can't just have one judge. Ed's counter to that is, well, he was double-blind. Yeah. So If your judge is double-blind, that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. All right, the judge should not know what reading was intended for what target. Yeah. And that was actually one of the first things I did in my consulting at SRI. Their original reports have been published in Nature, and there was a scathing attack by a couple of Australian psychologists, Marx and Kamen, oh, yes. that said, well, if they looked at the actual transcripts, and you could tell things like there was a reference here to the viewing I did yesterday, and that told you where in the sequence things were, mm -hmm. and maybe, and you could logically match things up well that way. Well, I reanalyzed all those things. The first one, I, mm -hmm. I did the logic part of it, right? Yeah. I, pulled out all the statements that would give you things like, this went before uh, such and such You removed those kind of statements thing. and then had it rejudged. And the, if working on those statements, you could maybe match two or three of the things, uh -huh. but not eight of the nine or something yeah. like that. And then I also brought in a whole new judge with all of those things removed, and he matched things just as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was, it was a reasonable criticism. They hadn't learned the importance of getting rid of stuff which you would, might think was irrelevant, but if you want to push the uh, guessing hypothesis further, it matters. Mm -hmm. So 
because you were part of the research team, you were necessarily very sensitive to criticisms that uh, had been in the literature from uh, skeptical uh, investigators. I was sensitive to that for a long time before that. I've been reading the the work of the pseudo-skeptics since I was a teenager, mm -hmm. so I know what that was. Well, do you consider all the skeptics pseudo-skeptics? <sighs> I try to never use words like all, <laughs> but let's say probably at least 95%. Mm -hmm. Pseudo-skeptics in this sense. To me, a skeptic is someone who says, the current explanation of why such and such happens strikes me as inadequate. I'd like to find a better explanation, something that fits the facts better. A skeptic is open-minded and curious. They really want to know. The pseudo-skeptics are really people who say, I believe what they reported couldn't have happened, and I want the prestige of appearing to be scientific and logical, so I'm going to call myself a skeptic, but really they're debunkers. Mm -hmm. um, I have not found, well, no, that's getting too close to all. By and large, I have no respect for the pseudo-skeptics. They are proponents of an alternate worldview who are willing, who want to appear scientific, but mm -hmm. who break all the rules of logic and mm -hmm. science to mm -hmm. attack things. But in the case of Marx and Kamen that you, you just mentioned, they actually, uh, through their criticism, helped you to tighten the protocol a yeah. bit. Uh -huh. yeah. And so that can be useful. Yeah, that one turned out to be useful. Mm -hmm. But the worst skeptics, in the sense of the ones who really make you do changes, almost always come from within parapsychology itself. Yeah. I mean, I've criticized some people's experiments and real they realized they, they have to do them better and the like. Mm -hmm. I, I'm well aware of the fact that uh, parapsychologists are, can be extremely critical of each other. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it strikes me to a fault. <laughs> yes, sometimes to a fault. Okay. Mm -hmm. I there's this issue of resistance to the reality of psychic functioning. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of fear of psychic abilities, even among people who are supposed to be scientists and objectively investigating this. Mm -hmm. But who wants to say I'm afraid? Hey, I'm a big, tough scientist. I'm not afraid of anything. Yeah. But my reasonable criticisms of this show there's a flaw. One of the ways this comes out is in a phenomena I've called the the religion of the 0.05 level. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you do an experiment, say, card guessing or something like that, and instead of getting 20% right, which would be what chance would predict, somebody averages 22% over a long period, and it's statistically significant at the 05 level. Mm -hmm. It would happen less than 5 in 100 times, yeah. which is the the customary level for assuming that something is really happening. Mm -hmm. Well, if you do a parapsychology experiment presented at the Parapsychological Association meetings, and it's significant at the 0.05 level, there won't really be any criticisms of it unless there really is a major methodological mm -hmm. fault. Mm -hmm. which It's unlikely that papers like that make it through the mm -hmm. selection committee. But if you do an experiment where the psychic material is much stronger than that. Yeah. All sorts of super methodological criticisms come up that I suspect are driven by a fear of psi. As long as it's a little statistical effect, we cannot consider the implications of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, Take psychokinesis, for instance, the ability of the mind to affect matter. Yeah. Well, if in a machine rolling dice you get a little bit more than one-sixth of a particular face, that's interesting in an abstract sort of way. Mm -hmm. But if somebody could regularly produce one ounce of push by psychic means for a minute, they could kill anybody they want to just by holding down the mitral valve on the heart and depriving the brain of blood. Be a completely undetectable crime, they'd say the person had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Again, it's not that long since we burned people at the stake. And, and there is some abilities. Uh, discussion in the anthropology literature about what they call death by hexing. Yes. It's, I mean, there there's some documented cases that suggest this is a real possibility. Mm -hmm. 
although of course anthropologists have a lot of trouble with this. Yeah. Uh, an anthropologist friend told me a very amusing story once. He was with some shamans at some tribe in South America, and they'd been talking about people who'd been killed by magic. And he explained how Western science has explained this, that when the person knows their curse, since they've been culturally right. conditioned to know something terrible this, is happening, the anxiety the stress response kicks in. And they but died. there are cases where they didn't even know. Right. Right. <laughs> but when he told this, yeah. the shamans all rolled on the floor laughing. <laughs> That's what you Westerners believe? <laughs> if you know you've been hexed, you'll get a shaman to protect you. <laughs> the only effective hexes are ones you don't know about. <laughs> you Westerners are something. <laughs> now, as far as I know, there are no parapsychological experiments being done on nasty uses of psi like that, and that's fine with me. Yeah. I don't want it to be possible. I don't know. I, well, I we, we could look possible. at some of the studies that were done in the old Soviet Union. I think they, they did look at some of those things. Yeah, they did some of them there, but the ones I've looked at so far, they mm -hmm. were wild. They weren't being very scientific. But since you brought up shamanism, it does seem to me that uh, in in the uh, literature of shamanistic training, there's a great deal we could learn about remote viewing. Be because they often, I mean, to become a shaman, sometimes it's a requirement that you uh, are, are sent off to the jungle to find uh, objects that have been hidden. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, a person is often picked to be trained as a shaman because something strange is happening with them. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when a kid in our culture has something strange happen to him, what do we do? We send him to the doctor because yeah. they must be sick. Mm -hmm. And the kid is told he's sick mm -hmm. and maybe given drugs to suppress whatever is happening. Yeah. That is not a supportive environment like being told, hey, you may have the talent to become a shaman. We're going to apprentice you with old so-and-so, that good shaman in the next village, and maybe you'll get mm -hmm. somewhere. What a difference that can make. Mm -hmm. One of my students at the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology did his dissertation research on what he called the bright shadow. Mm -hmm. This was a term I had never heard before, although he said Carl Jung actually used it. Uh -huh. Most people have heard of the idea of the shadow part of our minds, mm -hmm. the part the shameful parts that we repress and yes. don't want to own up to. But it turns out there have always been a fair number of kids, usually, who have some fantastic spiritual experience, mm -hmm. just like a grown-up might have. And when they tell it, they're told the devil's possessing them, they're yeah. told they're sick and taken to the doctor, and they end up totally repressing this part of themselves in order to get by. And later in life, they realize they took some vital part of their own psyche and squeezed it down, and their life has been very lacking because of that. Mm -hmm. uh, my student was someone who had had this happen to him, which created a considerable mm -hmm. personal interest. And if they can do psychological work to unrepress this bright shadow part, it's very important. So here you are. You mm -hmm. have something that may be psychic, and in one culture you're told you're nuts. Maybe you need to be institutionalized. You must be schizophrenic. You know, some of the old tests of psychopathology included a belief in psychic stuff as an instance that you were probably crazy. Yeah, by definition. Yeah, by <laughs> definition. <laughs> Whereas Charlie, if you're told you're talented, mm -hmm. it's very different. Our time is up, Charlie. This has been a wonderful discussion. And just remember, Jeff, you're probably talented rather than crazy. <laughs> <laughs> All the viewers, too. No, uh, let, let me let me add to that. You can be crazy, <laughs> but that's independent of whether or not you're psychic. You crazy might, people have psychic both. experiences, right? You might be both, but yeah. just because you've had an unusual psychic or spiritual mm -hmm. experience does not automatically mean you're mentally ill in any form. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being with me, Charlie. My pleasure, and thank you for being with us. <laughs> Thank you.